Hello and welcome to another Raw Umber video. I am Lisa Dingemans and today I'm going to show you my favorite oil painting materials. Before we start, I just want to point out that I am not affiliated with any of these art stores or any of the products. I'm just trying to recommend the things that I like. I also want to point out that I didn't get all this stuff yesterday, you know. You don't need all of this in order to make good painting. When you start painting and you enjoy it, you'll slowly build up your collection of stuff you like. All you really need is a few brushes, paints, something to paint on to start practicing. But I do want to show you what materials I like to use specifically. So if that's what you're looking for, or some general tips on how to use oil materials, then keep watching. So first I want to talk about easels. I've tried loads of different easels and the best easel is definitely a sturdy easel. My favorites are a nice wooden sturdy easel and a metal landscape easel. Some people also like using a box easel. I'm not a big fan, they're a bit too heavy and I don't like lugging a lot of stuff around when I'm landscaping outside. So let's move on to palettes. So there's loads of different palettes and I'm going to tell you which ones I think is the best and the worst. So the first of all, there's two types. You've got handheld and not handheld. The difference being that one you hold in your hand and the other one you set on the table. Glass is perfect for this as it's easy to clean. I would go for a grey glass palette rather than a see-through one as grey is easier to mix on them. Handheld is really useful if you're going to walk back and forth with your palette or work outside and do plein air painting for instance. Um, you also see a lot of these plastic palettes around. Do not get them. Certainly not for oil paint. They're really annoying to clean with the indentations and the white makes all your colors look really dark. Now onto handheld palettes. They have been used throughout the ages of all kinds of artists, as you can see. Um, you can always put these down on a table as well, but they have the added flexibility of being able to be walked around or held while you're standing up. So a handheld palette should be held like this, like you see in this picture, not like this. It ideally should balance on your arm and not need you to grip it tightly. Firstly, I want to show you the best palette. New Wave palettes are really good. They're huge, which gives you a lot of painting surface and they balance perfectly. They come in a nice neutral gray and brown, which is perfect for mixing. They are a bit pricey though, so I'm going to also give you some more economical options. First, we have the tier of pads. Really nice, no cleaning, just tear it off and in the bin it goes. I'm personally not the biggest fan as they absorb the oil and the oil paint, which sort of doesn't leave me any paint to actually paint with. But some people like them. If you do get one, get a grey one, preferably as it's easier to judge color on a neutral grey than rather than on white, which makes all your colors look really dark by extension. Next up, the classic wooden palette. It's used by Sargent, it's used by Rembrandt, it's used by so many old masters. They're usually kidney shaped, so it balances on your arm. Um, make sure to buy a varnished one or to varnish it yourself. Untreated wood like this slurps up the paint and leaves you with nothing to paint with. The wooden palette, I'll link down below, is my preferred choice for landscape painting and it's a really good budget palette for beginners. It was the first one I bought and I still use it. Finally, don't forget to get a palette knife. It's useful to mix paint and clean your palette with. Anyone will do, but try and go for one that's pretty flexible, not like a kitchen knife. So let's chat about brushes. So here I've got my brushes. I like to keep them up in a zipped up wallet. I got it from Cassart with some really cheap brushes at the time, but I believe you can also get it on its own. I tried using a bamboo mat, but it ruined my brushes because the brush hairs got stuck right in the bamboo. Also, when you're getting brushes, make sure the handle is long. Like I showed you in my 
how to measure video you always want to hold the brush or the pencil at the end. There are lots of brushes around. I'm not going to get into all the different ones but because the video might get a bit long um, but I might do a separate video on that. Um, but for now the main difference is Hawk, Synthetic and Sable. Hawks are the main brush, they're cheap, they give a soft stroke, they're versatile, Synthetic is a more clean stroke and Sables are good for details. I personally use Hawks for almost everything, but like my teacher told me, just buy a brush every time you're in the art shop and you'll build up a whole collection like you can see here. Okay, now on to paints. I have a lot of them. It's a little bit the same like brushes. If you just want to try things out and see what you like, that's usually the best way. But for me, the main paints I use are ivory black, raw umber, titanium white and the primaries. Now you've got your oil paints and your other supplies, of course you need something to thin your oil paints with as well. So that is called medium. Medium can consist of all kinds of stuff, um, which can get very confusing, but all you need to know right now is that oil paint is just basically mud or pigment mixed with oil. So in order to thin it, you need oil. Nuts and seed oils are drying oils, plant oils are not drying oils. So walnut, poppy, linseed oil, they're all good options. So I won't really get into all the different oils in this video um, because it's already quite a lot of information I'm guessing. But uh, linseed oil is a really good general oil to use. A lot of people also like to mix solvents or turpentine in with the oil to make it a bit more liquid and quicker drying. Um, when you use solvent, always use odorless turpentine or low odor. Don't use mineral spirits, don't use pure turpentine, it's really bad for you. So basically don't drink it, this goes for anything with oil paint. Don't drink it, don't keep soaked rags in your pocket, don't eat it. It's pretty basic, but it's good to know. Little side note as well, oil and solvents are both highly flammable. So throw them, throw any rags away. Don't store them all in one big pile waiting to be, um, you know, put on fire or something. And, you know, just be safe with these sort of things. So now we need to store that medium. And where do you store it? Well, I like to use some dippers. Basically anything will do, a jar or a um, pot, as long as it's not plastic, because it will melt. Um, but I really like these. Um, I have to thank Brian for getting them for me. I actually can't get them in England. They're great, they don't spill even if you drop them because of their shape. But it's just a nice thing, you know, a jar will do just as well. Last and probably also the least important, brush washers. Mine is pretty well used, as you can see, it's a little bit stuck, I have a bit of trouble opening it, but um, they should be easy to open with the clips and they are completely waterproof with these clips. Um, and they have a little sieve in the bottom, which makes the oil residue sink to the bottom, uh, which means you can just swirl your brushes around them like this to clean them. Then you just need a bit of dishwashing soap and voila, you got a clean brush. You can also store them in oil overnight to prevent them from drying out. So I put oil in my brush cleaner, but most people actually use um, low odor solvents. It's a little bit quicker, but I'm trying not to be toxic. As you can see here, I just keep rubbing pure dishwashing soap on my brush until the foam comes out clean. Then I can just rinse the brush and it's clean. Um, then some people like to wrap some tissue around their brushes to keep them from losing their shape after that. But I'm a little bit too lazy to do that every time, but um, that's the official best way. Okay, so I hope that this was uh, useful to you and you learned a little bit about, about oil painting materials. And um, I'll talk to you next time.
Hello, everybody. Um, so first of all, I'm going to answer some questions that some people have already sent in. And I've got my lovely assistant across the table from me who's going to pose some of the questions. So we're going to start with those. And then um, I'll also answer the ones that we see in the chats. So what was the first question, please? OK, so for Paul from Essex would like to know, what is your favorite oil paint brand? That's a good question. Um, actually, my opinion is that brands don't matter that much, but the best brand definitely for me is Michael Harding and Old Holland. But for beginners, I also think that Windsor & Newton is really, really good. And it's good to try out when it's something a little bit less, um, a little bit less expensive. OK, so the second question is mm -hmm. Anne from Sussex. What is the difference between different brush shapes? What are your favorites to use? Um, Filbert is definitely the most versatile. Filbert is a little bit shaped like, like this, if that makes sense. So a little bit like sort of rounded square. Um, and what's nice about it is that you can use it to make thin marks, but also nice and thick ones. And then you've got a flat brush, which is a bit more square shaped which is really good for if you want to have a really clear shape. Um, and then you've got the round brush, which is mostly used for lines, that sort of thing. OK, so we have Kate from Chorley Wood. How do you clean your palette? Um, I usually start by taking my palette knife and sort of just scraping off all the paint. And then afterwards, I go over with a bit of Sensador, so not turpentine, so odorless turpentine and on a tissue and just wipe that all off. And it's actually good if your palette's a little bit stained still, because actually that gives the palette a nice sort of neutral color to um, that. That's easier for mixing afterwards. So you can leave a bit of the paint on. We got the. OK, so let's have a look at somebody on YouTube um, from Lark Mangles. Is the oil turpenoid mix to thin paint as well as to clean brushes? Or do you just use turpenoid to make the paint thinner? Well, you've got the fat over lean rule, which is a little bit complicated. Um, when you're painting in oils, you've got the canvas here and then you have your oil layer on top, right? So what you want is every time you add another layer, you want it to be fatter because otherwise if this layer, layer underneath dries a little bit too soon, then, um, oh, sorry, too slow, then that is still sort of moving while the layer on top is already dry. So what you do is you mix turpenoid or low odorless turpentine at the start. So you can use that because it's quick drying. So your first layer is nice and nice and dry and then every time you add another layer you use a little bit more oil so it's fatter as per layer and then you can also use that to clean your brushes and usually people just use sansador to clean their brushes um, because it's nice and quick and it's really cheap but i personally use oil because um i have a bit of sensitive lungs sort of thing going on so it's better for my um for my health but you can use both. OK, so on the same subject of oil, Brian has asked what is stand oil and Benedetta has asked which one is best for a beginner. Um, stand oil is basically usually linseed oil that's just been standing for a while. So you you have your, you can make it yourself. You just have a whole load of linseed oil and you just leave the top off and um, just let that stand in the sun. and what. What happens is it gets thicker, really gloopy, sort of a bit like honey, which is really good for glazing because it levels out the paint because it's a very slow dryer, um, which is really nice for if you want a shiny finish, that sort of thing. But it can be a bit tricky to work with. You have to thin it down with quite a lot of uh, turpentine or maybe even um, varnish, and that helps for glazing. And Benedetta. Oh, on... was the what was your second question? Oh, the best way to clean. No, which oil? Oh, which one is the best for a beginner? Which oil? 
um, linseed oil is definitely the easiest to start with because the main three oils that people use are poppy, walnuts and linseeds. And linseed out of the three is the quickest dryer with the most sturdy layer. So walnut oil is a little bit slower to dry and poppy is a little bit more brittle. So linseed oil is a nice sort of starter oil that you can try out. Okay, so we have a question from Raw Umber Studios and they want to know, do you prefer hog or sable brushes? From Raw Umber Studios? Yep, that's the question. Okay. Okay, um, I prefer hog myself because they're more versatile. So sable, they are really nice for finishing and for details, but for most work they're too they're a bit too fragile so um i use hog for most of it and then i use sable for the details okay so we also have london lady 2011 says hello lizette i've bought a citrus non-harmful cleaner which says it can also be a thinner what are your views please that's probably zested or something equivalent yeah it's really good i mean it's basically the same as well it's not chemically the same but it has the same function as sansador but it's still not good for your health even though you know it has that lovely citrus smell so you still don't want to have these sort of rags with with the zested or whatever you're using laying around or on your skin if you leave it on your skin for too long it can give you a rash um don't ingest it but otherwise but that's just exactly the same as you would treat sensador but you can use it in the same way one thing that may happen is after a while the the citrusy smell can start irritating you a little bit but then just switch to a low odor a low odor version Okay, so we have a question on Facebook from Ezra. Is oil very different from acrylic? Is it worth practicing with acrylic or would it make more sense to go straight for oil paint? So he's scared to make mistakes with expensive products. That's very fair enough. We also had somebody else ask a question that was sort of similar, I think. Um, acrylics are actually very, very similar, but they are just a lot quicker to dry. So, um, with oil what i like about it is that you can keep pushing the paints around so you put what i do in my sunday demos often and what i'll do this week as well is i put down my white and then i put down my dark and i just sort of like push one into the other and i really like painting like that because it gives me a lot of flexibility acrylic doesn't really have that as much so you have to just be a little bit more careful about where you place your paint but otherwise, I have painted with acrylic and it works really, really well. So, I mean, for me, I always think as long as you're just practicing and having fun with the painting, that's the most important thing. And whatever medium you like to use, that's up to you. OK, so Ezra has more questions. Yeah. Uh, is it cool to paint on a flat table or is an easel required? Um, I mean, ultimately, you can paint however you want. But I personally like having the easel or the, the artwork facing me. So if it's flat like that, you can see that my, my line of sight is not really perpendicular. So you kind of want to lift it a little bit up towards you because otherwise you might have a distortion. So you might think, oh, it looks great. And then you turn it towards you and you've got some distortion going on in your drawing. So for that reason, if I do um, work, let's just say I'm in the plane or something, and I wanna paint something, I just put a book behind my, um, whatever I'm working on, like my canvas or something, if I'm doing gouache. And that way it's just lifted a little bit towards me, which sort of makes it a little bit easier to draw. So that's for me, the main thing. And a stand-up easel is really, really nice, but you do need the space for it. So. I mean, it's a bonus. And he also asked, can he use oil paint on wood found on skips and cardboard? Yes, you can. I really love painting on wood. The only thing is you have to make sure that when you paint with oils, oils obviously can rot. So this comes to a fat over lean rule again. So if you have your wood or your canvas or your 
cardboard, whatever you're using, if you then put the oil in, it might penetrate it, right? And that might cause the support, which is what you're painting on, to rot. So what you need to do is put a barrier layer there. So back in the day, they used um, rabbit skin glue. Nowadays, you can just use PVA glue, which you can just buy. You can buy archival PVA, which is a little bit better. But if you just think it's going to be quick practice, you can also use PVA just from um, B&Q and just put that on top so the paint can actually penetrate your support and then you can paint on top. There was another question about that, which I think you just answered. Um, somebody else, when you have paint on the palette, how long can you use it for? Um, when you let it dry out, not very long. So you've got quick drying colors and less quick drying colors. So in my demos, I usually use raw umber, which is one of the quickest drying colors. But for instance, titanium white is very slow drying. So if you leave your paints to air dry, on your palette, raw umber will be dry within three hours, so you'll it will just be it will be pretty hard or hard-ish, um, which means you can't really use it anymore. So what I usually end up doing is I either put them in the freezer, which stops them from drying, so I scrape them all off, put them in a little bit of plastic or something, just put that in the freezer, or put them under water, so you can have a little tray, something like the takeaway tray and just put your paints in there put the water on top so the air can't get to it and then just put that away or you can put some plastic foil on top of your uh, palette and that will also stop it from drying out so as long as the air doesn't get to it you're fine for well if it's the freezer indefinitely water two weeks and cling foil few days Okay, and somebody said walnut oil is the same as cooking walnut oil, which obviously it is, but you yes. generally don't want to cook with it. Well, you could. Better for a dressing. I mean, yeah, you you could you could use linseed that's made for painting for cooking, and you could use cooking linseed and walnut for painting. The only difference is that. The stuff that you buy in an art shop is a little bit more purified, so it will yellow less. It will, you know, so it's more like longevity. So you can technically, I mean, this is the thing about oil paint. Raw umber is just mud. So you could technically mix some mud with some cooking oil and you could paint with that. But um, nowadays you can just also just buy it in a tube. So it's a little bit easier. So that's what I end up doing. Okay, Ali Edgson <coughs> on YouTube. How long do you leave a painting before you varnish it and sell or exhibit it? Okay, yeah. Um, varnishing sort of seals the painting. So again, a fat of a lean thing, right? So you've got your painting, you've got your layers, and the the molecules in oil paint they will keep moving for quite a long time. So if you then seal that with uh, varnish that will cause cracks. So generally what's advised is to wait at least six months to varnish. So what I've done in the past is when I've got clients um, and they want the painting straight away, is I say, here's the painting now, framed and everything. I've put a layer of exhibition varnish on top, which is a little bit more porous, so lets the paint breathe a bit. And then in six months, I'll make an appointment with them to varnish again. And Sandra, on YouTube, how do you blend oils smoothly? Um, actually, I'm going to be touching on that this week on Sunday. Uh, I've just been uh, working on that. Um, but what it comes down to is you, instead of using the brush like that, like so pointed, you want to sort of angle it a little bit and let the brush do the work. So not not put a lot of pressure on the canvas and then just very gently sort of zigzag it in and zigzag it out again. And that will sort of blend it very nicely. Like oil paint, because it's wet for such a long time, it will blend really nicely. It's just a little bit of patience and just getting into how to hold your brush properly. But making sure not to press too hard is definitely a really good start. Jean Moyes asks, what's the best paper? Paper. Oil painting paper or drawing paper? 
Uh, doesn't specify. Uh, should okay. we get the drawing? Well, let's start. Well, let's do both. Um, for oil painting, let's let's start with oil painting paper. Oil painting paper. I'm personally not the biggest fan because it actually absorbs a lot of the oil in the paint, which makes the paint dry really, really quickly. Which, as I just said, I really like that oil is so slow to dry, so you can blend it and you can move it around. Um, so what I usually end up doing is using um, arches, oil painting paper, but then put some glue on top of it. And for drawing, there's a lot of different types of paper around. So for quick draw, I usually just use whatever I've got laying around because it's never going to be, I mean, I've used printer paper. But if I'm going to use, um, if I'm going to do a commission or a longer piece of work, I'll usually use arches, which is really nice, um, cold pressed, uh, nice heavy paper. Um, and arches also does a gray, and um, I believe brown paper, which is really nice because I like using charcoal and chalk. So those ones I really, really like. And otherwise, Canson is a slightly cheaper alternative that's really good for drawing as well. Okay, what about ga gauche, gauche, gouache. gouache when compared to oil? Gouache is sort of a mixture between watercolor and oil. I actually really like using it um, because now, especially now, we can't really go out that often and I can't really go out, out and paint in oils for a few hours. What I'll end up doing is I'll use the gouache for quick 20 minute studies of stuff in the park. And it's really nice like that. Um, so what was the question exactly? What about Compared it? Compared to oil. Compared to oil. So gouache is basically just, it's got the, it's got the thickness of oil and definitely the blending capacity, but it dries as quick as watercolor would. So I would say it's really good to get for quick studies and for practicing, because it's practicing how to use your brush, because it's very unforgiving like that. You lay your stroke down and that's it. It's dry pretty much. So you have to really make sure that you lay that stroke down properly and right. So that's really good to practice like that. Um, but for longer work, I usually go for oil because it has a lot more versatility and you can layer on um, for a longer time. With gouache, every time you layer a new layer of gouache, it will reactivate the paint. So we'll all get it muddy. Okay, so Mary asks, how do you prepare your canvas paper, whatever you paint on? Okay, um, so like I was saying, you need that barrier, right? So you've got your paint support, which is what you're painting on, which can be wood or paper or whatever you want to paint on. And then you've got your size, which is your barrier between the painting, the support and the paint, which can be uh, anything that stops moisture from coming from coming in. So in my case, I like using archival PVA glue, which I think I get from Gamblin. And then on top, what you can do is your, um, I lost the word for a second, but, the, oh, sorry, the primer. So uh, you've got acrylic and oil primer. I've tried both. Some people really like traditional methods. But for me, again, oil primer, it's got a lot of um, sort of turpentine. It's mixed with turpentine, so it really made the room completely, it was not good. Um, so I now end up using acrylic primer. So I end up using board, PVA glue, acrylic primer. I've done an article on this on uh, in Arts and Illustrators. I'll have to look up which um, a more in-depth one. So I'll have to look up which uh, number, but I'll I'll get back to you. Okay. So prize for most questions goes to Ezra uh, on Facebook, <laughs> and his last question, after saying "cool, thank you, and awesome," is: Do you have to varnish? No, you don't have to varnish. But what happens with oils? Um, 
with oil specifically, but also with any paint, but especially with oils, your darks will do something called sinking in. So what that means is when they dry, they will go more gray. So they won't go quite as dark as you'd like them to be. So you may paint something in a certain, um, you know, with a certain darkness. So for instance, this one on the back here, um, I paint with a lot of, I painted that with a lot of black. So if I wouldn't varnish that, all that black would turn out gray. So some people really like that aesthetic and then they just use matte varnish or no varnish. But for me, my paintings tend to be a little bit darker. So then I definitely varnish to make the darks pop out more. Okay, so Diane on YouTube says, what color palette would you use for portraits? Um, palette, I'm, I'm guessing you mean palette as in the color palette and not the palette that you hold. Um, so for portraits, it depends. There, I have two palettes I like to use uh, regularly. So one is a sort of low, low key, very easy, it's almost monochromatic palette, which is titanium white, raw sienna, burnt sienna and black. Um, and that's just a very, very sort of monochromatic sort of thing. Like for instance, the one behind me, I painted in that palette. And as you can see, there's not a lot of color in there. Um, but if I want a slightly more colorful palette, we'll use those colors plus some bright colors. So you can use cadmium red for that and cadmium yellow, but those paints are both toxic. So if you're trying to be non-toxic, um, for instance, you know, for whatever reason, um, then I like to use lemon yellow and bright reds. Okay, so the last question uh, that we have is from Tanya from North London. Uh, very simple. Why do you use such big brushes? Um, I tend to use bigger brushes because it um, stops me from getting too detailed too soon. And also, if you have a big painting or a bigger area that you're working on, you then don't want that whole area to be stuck with little brush marks that sort of move the paint around. So if you could just lay it out in one stroke, it just makes it look a little bit more, um, yeah, how you say it's spontaneous, a bit more, less overworked. Um, well, I think that's all the questions we have. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like it. Cool, perfect. Well, thank you all for watching. And um, I will log off then. And uh, I'll see you all on Sunday.